San Bonani Dumelang, Hue Mure, Molueni, Hue Medak. How are you guys doing? No, it's okay. It's okay. It's great. It's my kind privilege to be able to speak to you today about a subject that I'm deeply passionate about. This uh, particular continent is alive with opportunity, and so today I thought it'd be important for me to spend some time just articulating the potential that Africa is and where Africa is going. I think it's worth my while just simply asking this particular question. Why did President Barack Obama go to Kenya in the last couple of weeks? Firstly, if you think about the cost of the visit, it will cost the US taxpayer one billion rand for that one trip alone. I don't think as a taxpayer it would be appropriate for you to say, look, we should spend a billion rands allowing the president to go visit his family and have a nice family holiday. Simply inappropriate. But actually, there is a different reason why President Obama made a decision to go to the US, to, to go to Kenya. And I think in part, that reason speaks to this simple fact, is that he understands that he wasn't just going to meet up with his family members, he understands that he was going there to meet the 21st century continent, and I believe this continent is alive with possibility. <laughs> he recognizes the fact that the future, as we've articulated, is right here in this continent, articulated by young Africans that are coming from all over the world, recognizing the potential in this particular part of the world. And what for me is key is that I wanted to speak to you about Africa because I found this one poem, and I found it quite inspirational, that says this, look, I'm an African, not only because I was born there, but because my heart beats with Africa. I'm an African not because my skin is black, but because my mind is engaged by Africa. I'm an African not because I live on its soil, but because my soul is home in Africa. And quite frankly, when you look at how the, the Kenyan story points, it tells of a dynamic continent. I think often when people see images of Africa, this is perhaps maybe the image they see. It's the picture of an African who is poor, uneducated, malnourished and disease-ridden. It's in fact the message that many more people put forward to people. They say, look, this is what it means to be an African. Our history is a history that is born out of the fact that we've overcome much. We've lived in a pre-colonial, post-colonial world. We've, ach we've achieved here in South Africa a transition that in fact all over the world is celebrated as a transition from apartheid to a democratic state. But ultimately, what we have to do is not only live in that story, the hard work was done, now the question is, how do we address the challenges that Africa faces? How do we address the challenges of unemployment, in some spaces, poverty? And I'm here to propose to you, in fact, as former Nigerian finance minister argued, he said, we know that we can take charge of our own destinies if we have the will to reform. She also gave this great quote which said this, for the future of Africa, you have to achieve address poverty, and do business there. So, here's perhaps maybe a question I want to put before you. Many people say to me that in fact, when you think about Africa, when you think about the story of Africa, we must unlock its potential. Now, like you, I've heard that phrase far too often. And sometimes it can become frustrating when you hear a cliche, like let's say African solutions to African problems, etc. And it seems as though politicians, as soon as elections are done, I don't know about you, but their promises almost disappear. It's like an electoral campaign, and then soon after that, we forget about it. But in truth, there is something that is unlocking Africa's potential. There is something that's beginning to show the world that the world, in fact, can be different. And when you speak about unlocking Africa's potential, there are some pessimists who sit back and say, but Africa's problems are too big and too large. There is no ways we can be able to get this right. I am here to argue differently. I'm here to tell you that the fastest growing economies in the world, six out of the 10 are right here in this continent. Let me ask you this question. If you were to look at the world and ask what is the fastest growing country 
if you were just to use a GDP marker? Any guess? No, seriously. Nigeria is one, but the asset rebased has been one. We talk about GDP growth, so that's one. What other options are there? Give me an option. Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso. Are you from Burkina Faso? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you out of your misery. It's actually Botswana. Botswana's economic growth, if you look at where Botswana is, it's a country that moved from independence from Britain almost 50 years ago. It's got, in many ways, it's now no longer been referred to a poor African state. It's considered as the upper middle class, upper middle income country. In fact, in many ways, its average growth since 19. 1966 has been 9% to 1999. Exceptional growth, if you understand that when you look at Botswana, they have an incredibly progressive HIV program, which is addressing that. In fact, so successful that it's moved Botswana's life expectancy from 40 to 55. I see. But here's the thing. You might think Botswana is an exception to the rule. Six are the fastest growing economies in the world are here in Africa. Therefore, there must be other parts that are coming through here. In fact, other countries, a dozen countries, are already growing at levels of 6%. In fact, since 2000, trade between Africa and the rest of the world has increased by 200%, while the continent's foreign debt has declined by 25%. In fact, much of the growth has been on the back of a commodities price groom, and in the first decade of this continent, we saw that growth. We saw that commodity-based growth that is on the go. But here's the key trick, is that even a nation like Botswana is starting to recognize that it doesn't help anybody simply just investing in commodities. You need to diversify your economy, and what Botswana is starting to do is go towards places where they're looking at ecotourism, they're investing in their financial sector, and diversifying their economic growth. Perhaps. In many ways, if you were to think about where this country is going to grow, it will show that Botswana and the Pula is growing at a significant rate. Second, obviously, is Nigeria. If you look at where Nigeria, you've said, sir, it's such a great in that the fact that the asset rebased here in Africa shows that Nigeria's economy is growing at a significant rate. The Nigerian government has made it known that, in fact, they want to become the world's 20 biggest economies by 2020. Perhaps, maybe it's a little bit ambitious, but <laughs> the intent is there. For the first time, the African boom is driven not by only commodities, but it's driven by microenterprise, particularly in the manufacturing and the retail sector. The continent is anyone's investor dream. So the picture of Africa that we must have can't just be simply of that child on the side, poor. It must be a picture of a developing economy. So, why did President Obama go to Kenya? Because not only does he realize he got to Kenya and saw for himself the fact that now in Africa we've got Kenya as becoming the Silicon Valley of Africa, a place where innovation is taking place, certainly within technology. There's significant improvements that are taking place in Kenya on, on on, in their financial sector. If you think about M-Pesa, it tells you the story about how broadband technology is starting to take precedence in Africa and we're moving our economy along. And so here's the thing, is that if you look at the world today and you look at where Africa is going, if I was an investor, I would put my money here. But let me say this, for many African countries, they still face back inequality. They still face the fact that those who are left out in certain countries, the issue of race is still a predominant one. If we're going to achieve addressing historical injustices, we cannot do it without growth and being able to diversify economy. For if you're not growing anything, you cannot redistribute it. So here's the trick, is that in fact we must deal with this issue of inequality and we must understand that perhaps in some ways, what's brought us here isn't going to take us there. What is then Africa's shared tomorrow? Where is Africa going to go? And I believe change in Africa must become the norm, not the exception. 
We've got to be able to see democracy take its full root, for democracy only survives when power can move from one party to the next without fear of intimidation or violence. For it's the only way we can hold any leader to account is through electing a different one if that leader fails to do their job. My challenge is simply this. Where does South Africa fit into this issue? My experience of South Africa is that we should be leading the boom. We should be on the train. But where it's hard is that in fact we're not. The first decade of South Africa saw tremendous amount of growth and change. In fact, in the last number of years, we've seen our exports increase from just 30 billion rands to now almost 100 billion rands in 2011. But we haven't fully maximized the commodity boom so much so that we can address issues of unemployment. We will find ourselves paralyzed by policy, in, by policy indecision, will be suffocated by red tape, and will make it harder and harder for us as a country to be able to trade. So, as former President Bill Clinton once said, it must be about jobs. Our greatest war that we've got to fight today is about how do we maximize commodity growth and maximize our innovation as a country to make sure we address issues of unemployment. So, the first thing I want to say is that we've got to show a certain level of leadership. We've got to be clear for our own selves that when we talk about leaders and what leaders do, I want to quote from you in, from John Mahama who is the president of Ghana, who stood up at this year's State of the Nation address and said the following things. In the past, we had an energy crisis. We still do. I intend to fix it. I owe it to the Ghanaian people that I, John Dramani Mahama, will fix this challenge. It's quite unbelievable when you start to think how many leaders are taking responsibility for the, for the crisis that their country is in and simply being able to stand up and say, I, as the leader of that country, will take responsibility. You ask me the question, these countries I've cited for you, Kenya, Nigeria, how have they done it? They've moved away and said, let government step out the way and let, in some ways, us allow the space for privatization and diversification of certain industries take the way forward. They've led the way to say we're going to write a new chapter where government isn't at the forefront simply of all development, but then certain industries in the private sector begin to grow. So here's some keys. I want to leave you just with five thoughts, five things that I believe nations that are growing, particularly here in Africa, are doing exceptionally well. Some key things is that they educate for the economy. Economies all over the world recognize that they've got to move away from simply being agricultural, industrial, to move towards information and connection. Our sense is that we've got to be educating the next generation of Africans, not simply to be people who are working in an industrial era, although some countries in Africa must industrialize, but we must transition our education system to make sure more people are citizens of a digital era and are part of the information revolution that is taking place here in this particular continent. It has to ultimately ensure that we can graduate our economies through that. We've got to get more maths and science students so that we can maximize our opportunities to move from, as we see here in South Africa, a fairly high carbon intensive coal-based uh, energy sector towards different technologies that are sustainable. To do that, we need to have an education system on the backdrop of that. The second is that we've got to demonstrate leadership. We've got to find accountability for leaders in how they lead their countries. Thirdly, we've got to without fail, ensure that we become business friendly. Ladies and gentlemen, mine is simply to argue that no job, in fact, no government, in fact, creates the jobs. It is creating the enabling environments that make it possible for micro-enterprise to grow. My dream for South Africa is to make sure that young entrepreneurs can come on board and be able to start their businesses where ultimately we can address the issues of unemployment. We have to do that, and when you see economies in Africa that are growing, they're on the backbone of being able to free up people to become more business friendly. We have to cut red tape, we have to make it easier to demolish bureaucracy. And as I see, sometimes, you know, when you're trying to apply for a business license in this country, the amount of forms that you have to complete might just put you off from being able to start in the first place. I'm saying we've got to make it easier, move our nations away from red tape 
towards a red carpet for business so that we can do that. That's why you... <laughs> you cannot in any way have visa regulations that make it harder for people to get into the country. You must make it easier for people to get into the country. Africa must become the most creative, the most innovative in this continent. That's why I love this great place. Governments must do everything that will harness and enable this culture of entrepreneurship and innovation. We have to make it easier for people to trade. You see, it's not just allowing for small businesses to thrive, but why are we not trading amongst ourselves as Africans? My hope is that ultimately, if you look at even Europe, 60% of the total trade is traded amongst Europe. Whereas when you look at Africa, only 10% of what is traded in Africa is traded amongst African countries. We have to change that and make sure that we can trade more amongst ourselves. And this way, we've got to streamline our import and export procedures. We have to introduce one-stop shop, uh, one -stop shop um, visa centers. We have to make it easier for people to come through. I am proposing that even for SADC, we've got to make sure that there can only be one visa for the whole SADC region so that everybody can commute backwards and forwards and goods can get from one place to the next far easier. Thirdly, and this is a difficult one, we have to cut corruption. <laughs> we have to take a zero tolerance approach towards corruption. African states that are beginning to develop all over the continent understand that corruption favors a few at the expense of the many. And in truth, it takes the resources a way that should be used for development, such as education, etc. So we have to take corruption away. It's not only in the public sector, it has to be in the private sector. We have to fight the battle against illicit capital flows. We have to make sure that South Africa is freed away from corruption. And Africa and African states demonstrate that corruption is becoming a human disaster rather than a natural disaster. Fourthly, we have to invest in infrastructure. Many African states still battle with infrastructure backlogs. And I believe road, rail, ports give us the best opportunities. We mustn't fear. Africa is the place where you can put your business, you can put your commodities, you can ultimately make sure that we can build airports and airlines and, and different road infrastructure to make it possible for us to trade amongst ourselves as Africans. I have already listed the fact that education plays a critical role. If we're going to make sure that kids who've got maths and science can develop, these are nations that are taking it forward. So President Obama's return to Kenya, to Ethiopia, is him acknowledging in many ways that Africa is the potential. Africa is going to dominate the 21st century, and I believe we can capitalize on that. We've got to take the advantage of us having commodities and advantage of us having the ability to grow. And ultimately, as Nigeria is showing that it wants to not only be a fifth of the, of the total population in the continent, we will have more and more consumers in this particular continent. So Africa's population is set to double by 2050, which opens up opportunity for investment, opportunities for trade, and opportunities that we can develop. Many of these will be young people, and so I want to appeal. What makes me get up every day to go to work is because young people are the bedrock of where Africa is going to go. If we can educate them, free them, we can see a continent whose picture is no longer one of a impoverished, malnourished child to one that is innovative and a beacon for the world. And I believe in the spirit of young people in this continent, and I think we could change our own story as Africans. Thank you very, very much.